Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 14th of July 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is TF2 again. I think we're going to have a TF2 week. It's just how I feel. I'm going to play a different class every day. And I'm playing Spy. Spy is actually my weakest class, so I'm looking to practice this. I'm not very good at Spy at all, so let's see if we can get a little bit better in the duration of this particular episode. First email comes in from Sean that says, I was recently playing through Fear 3 with my girlfriend when I got to thinking why many games only offer online co-op and not split screen. Don't get me wrong, online is a great thing and I play many games online, but sometimes when I have a few friends over, it's fun to just pop in a game and play like back in the old golden eye days. It's as if the developers assume that people don't actually hang out anymore. Anyway, the question is, do you think if developers are going to put in a co-op feature that it should be split screen as well as online? I don't think it's because developers think that people don't hang out anymore. I think that's a ridiculous assertion for a developer to consider. What I think is that it comes down to the technical limitations of consoles. Right now, we're in a situation where barely any game, for instance, actually runs in 1080p on a console. Almost every new game I have, I think except Killzone in non-3D mode, runs in 720p, not 1080 that indicates the severe limitations of consoles at this point. Not only that, but we're getting games that have narrower and narrower field of view and things like that. So to then suggest, hey, let's do split screen, that's an even bigger problem. Much, much bigger problem. Then what you're having to do is effectively render two games. And usually what they have to do is cut down on the detail level to make it work. I mean, I'd like to give an example. There was a game from the launch lineup of the Xbox 360, it was called Perfect Dark Zero. The game was forgettable in terms of its single player, and it certainly wasn't a great looking game to begin with. But it had four player split screen, and that was actually kind of fun, but my god did it run badly. The frame rate was really low, and it looked abysmal. Now consider the graphics quality of that, versus the graphics quality of a modern title. Could you really pull off split screen on a modern title like that on the current console hardware? You can do it on a PC, certainly, but then you run into other problems. Why do people, for instance, not have a lot of split-screen co-op on a PC? Because, generally speaking, you play PC games on a monitor. Monitors are quite small. Split-screen on a monitor, not a very good idea, usually. You don't have a lot of screen space to work with. It's not particularly fun. Not to mention that if you're going to play it with a keyboard and mouse, then it's going to be a complete pain to deal with if you want to plug in, say, two keyboard and mouse in order to do that, or you have to force someone to use a controller. Then you get to problems with, hey, if I want two keyboards, I need the desk space, I need the USB ports for all of this stuff. It's, it's a nightmare. So as far as I can tell, it really is down to technical limitations as opposed to anything else. It's just that consoles can't handle it anymore. It's as simple as that. I think we might see a little bit more of it on PS3, because I think that's the only console that can really deal with it. And I make that assertion on the basis that they made a big deal of being able to play a 3D game on a PS3 with two sets of 3D glasses, and each set of 3D glasses polarized to show a different set of images. Now, evidently, that works. And... That is interesting. That's a really interesting piece of technology. It's very, very cool indeed. But honestly, I don't know if any other machine can really handle it to a great degree. And it seems to me that developers are not willing to sacrifice graphics quality and frame rate in order to get that kind of thing. So there you go. It's unfortunate, but it is the case. And if you want that kind of action, I would look towards Xbox Live Arcade more. There's plenty of games on that which have a local co-op option or indeed local competitive with up to four players. And they are, as a direct result, an awful lot of fun. This one comes in from Egal. It says, You mentioned several times in past mailboxes that second-hand buyers hurt developers and publishers more than piracy. I, however, think that there is a crucial difference between the two. It is true that both are potential markets, but it is incorrect to compare the two. Both would make more money for the companies if they would buy the game new, but pirated copies are stolen from the companies, while used games are games that didn't make as much profit as the companies would like them to. Should it surprise us that companies want to make more money from their product? I'm sure that car manufacturers, for example, would love you to stop buying used cars and maybe get a new car every year instead of five. Do you really think that second-hand buyers and pirates are comparable? Also, do you think the games companies deserve more profit from the games? And should this profit be drawn from the second-hand market? If so, how are games different from cars, books, or any other commodities? We have no problems buying second-hand. 
Okay, well, there's a few things to deal with there. The first being that, one, it's not stolen from the company. Let's please get the word steal out of this. It is not theft in either the legal or the practical sense. It is not the same thing. So throw that completely out of the window because that tends to pollute arguments with false terminology and misunderstanding. Secondly, the thing about used cars is that because of the price of a car, the used car market is kind of required. I mean, really, if you couldn't trade in your car, there would actually be a lot less new sales. Huge numbers. Because you can't afford to buy new cars over and over again. Now, the same argument can be applied, theoretically, to games. However, there are a few differences to bear in mind. One, of course, is the fact that they are nowhere near as expensive. Two is the fact that when we're talking about used sales, we're more often than not, and this is what the publishers are targeting as well, talking about first couple of weeks used sales. We're talking about people that bought the game and then traded it in a couple of days later because they didn't want it or whatever, and then the retailer marked it down by $5 and sold it next to the new one. And that's the real problem with it. That's where most of the lost profit actually happens. Now, later on, not such a big deal, but in the first few weeks, those used sales are damaging, and it's the kind of thing that the publishers want to try and avoid. Now, maybe this is just the publisher looking in a too short-term kind of fashion at the sales figures. I think that's actually a problem in the current industry, honestly, that a lot of publishers do look at the sales figures in the first few weeks, and then that's it. They don't care anymore. Whereas, say, with the PC, they should really be looking over the long term. I mean, the sales over one, year, one to two years are actually what they should be looking at because of the way that digital distribution w affects the long-term shelf life of a game versus what would say be on a shelf in a retailer on a console that then loses shelf space and gets thrown in the bargain bin after a couple of weeks. The second thing to consider is that a used car or even a used book and things like that, they tend to be of significantly poorer quality than a new one. For instance, if I buy a used game, that game is going to last as long as a new game would. Eh? And in theory, it is identical. As long as the CD slash DVD slash Blu-ray actually works, then that is all you need to know. It's digital. Either it works or it doesn't. It's as simple as that. With a car, when you buy a used car, there are all sorts of things to take into consideration. And you've got to bear in mind that some of the life of that car has already been used. It is not going to run for as long as a new one. It doesn't have the same amenities as a new one. It's an older model. You don't get older models of games, per se, unless you're talking about, say, sports franchises. As a result, the comparison is extremely difficult to draw, and it's also the reason that used games are perhaps more damaging than anything else. I would think that used digital media in general is more damaging to sales than anything else. Used CDs, for instance. Again, pretty much the same thing. Possibly your scratches, but easily removed with a scratch removal tool, and it is good as new. You can't do that with a car. You can't do that with second-hand electronics or anything like that. They tend to be more out of date. Now... How different is piracy and use sales? Well, I do not agree that use sales should be abolished or made illegal or anything like that. At the end of the day, when you buy a product, as far as I'm concerned, you have the right to resell. Now, companies will not necessarily agree with you on this one. And indeed, thanks to Steam, PC gamers mostly can't do that anymore. And that's something to consider. We can't have used sales now. Steam doesn't work that way, digital distribution in general, with the exception of Green Man Gaming, and even then, it's not a particularly good deal doesn't work that way. We're locked into that now. There's not really any way out of it, and that's just the price we pay. That said, our games are cheaper, so I suppose that kind of makes up for it. PC games do not cost as much as console games in the vast majority of instances, and more often than not, if you know where to look, you can pick up a brand new PC game for half the price of the console version. For instance, if you're in the UK, a lot of new releases come out at $17.99, as opposed to the console version, which will be about £35, at a store like, say, Play.com or Amazon or The Hut or Zavi. So those are, again, things to consider. The overall effect of it, when you look at it in a very simple way, is that piracy and used sales are identical, in the sense that neither of them give any money to the publisher and developer. So, in a sense, that's bad. You can look at it in another way, however, and this is why on this argument I'm, I'm not so much sitting on the fence, but I see both sides of it. Because if we go back to the old car analogy in the way that if the used car market didn't exist, less new cars would be sold simply because people couldn't afford to buy them. We can apply the same thing to games and say, well, 
particularly when it comes to consoles, less new games would be sold as a direct result of removing used sales entirely from the market. And it also comes down to, once again, as I said, if you own a game, as far as I'm concerned, you should have the right to flog it. <laughs> you bought it, for God's sake. I didn't buy a license, even if the law says I didn't. Even in that respect, it's kind of a grey area. I bought this physical item. I want to trade this physical item. I wish to barter it for a cow. If I wish to barter this copy of Madden 2011 for a freaking cow, then allow me to barter it. We've been able to do this for thousands of years. We can't totally stop it now. Good God. So maybe that works. The problem is it's so hard to quantify. That's why it's a really difficult debate to wade into in that respect. Does it apply? Does it not apply? Who knows? But one way or the other, I think what you should conclude from this is that piracy does not benefit the market in the same way that the used game sales do. Some people will make the argument that, oh, well, I wouldn't have bought the sequel to this if I hadn't pirated the first one. But my counter argument would be, you know all those games that didn't get sequels because you decided to pirate the original as opposed to buying it? Yeah. You don't get to buy the sequel because they didn't make enough money on the first one. They didn't see enough support for original IP. Piracy is a contributing factor. It is not the massive bugbear that publishers make it out to be. It is not the sole reason why certain games fail, but it certainly contributes to it and there's no way to argue otherwise, which is the reason that, of course, you shouldn't be doing it. This one comes in from Robert the Wise that says, In your previous mailboxes, you've talked a lot about how mods extend a PC game's shelf life. Civilization 4 benefited from mods greatly, and the developer actively supported the modding scene. As Civ 5 was coming, the devs assured the community that they will support the modding in Civ 5 by including an in-game mod manager and a powerful modding tool. The problem was that the devs also planned to add additional civilizations via DLC, and this got in conflict with the support of the modding scene. The promised modding tool would allow modders to implement new civilizations, which could be even better than the devs' DLC. So the devs massively castrated the modding tool. For example, they disabled the possibility to add your own sound files. What do you think about this example? Is it displaying a fundamental conflict between support of modding and the economic model of DLC, or is it just another example of DLCs done wrong? Well, in my opinion, it's an example of DLCs done wrong. I don't foresee myself ever paying for Civilization in Civ V, and in fact, Civ V is certainly the weakest Civ game since Civ III, which is a dumb thing to say because there was only really one game in between that, but you get the idea. Civ V is really down there in terms of games that... I enjoyed from the Civilization series. And hell, I even enjoyed Call to Power and Call to Power 2, which weren't even made by Firaxis more than I did Civ 5. Adding Civilizations to it is kind of lousy. It's never really been an attractive point. So I'm going to play another Civ because it completely changes the way the game works. It doesn't change it that much, even in Civ 5, so I can't see myself buying that. And, as you've said, there is then a conflict. If you can't add your own sound files and there's all sorts of other limitations on the mod manager, then you can't do much with it. I mean, you're not going to get another Fall From Heaven 2, are you? You're not going to get these really good quality mods that genuinely turn the game into something completely different and are actually a reason to buy it. I mean, God, I've sold so many people on Civ 4 by just saying, hey, go and look at what Fall From Heaven 2 is. Does this not look amazing? Go get it just for Fall From Heaven 2. It is that damn good. It seems like they have missed an opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong, I like the fact that mods are free, but I also think that people should be rewarded for their work, and we're seeing this more and more. For instance, community-designed items and maps in Team Fortress 2, and you can support them directly through the Team Fortress 2 marketplace. Really cool thing. That encourages higher and higher quality development from mod makers who can actually make a little bit of money on the side or maybe even make a living from that. We've got the forthcoming Blizzard Marketplace in Heart of the Swarm, which was indeed supposed to be out with Wings of Liberty, but is not at the moment, which will allow certain people to sell really good quality custom maps for StarCraft 2. And again, I believe in that as well. I think that is a good thing indeed. Why exactly could they have not done that with Civ 5? I have to wonder. Okay, so can we have a community civilization? What's wrong? with that why can't we download civilizations that other guys have created and maybe there's a small charge for that and they can make money on that as well it doesn't make any sense to stifle out your modding scene because in the long run people are not going to stick around civ 5 because you release paid civilizations in fact they're less likely to because they feel like oh well i don't have a complete game anymore you know what? i'm just going to stop playing it it's kind of how i feel when i leave a game like that and i come back and there's 5,000 dlc for the freaking thing i'm thinking well i'm going to spend more on this dlc than i did on the game in the first place and i don't really care that much about it anymore it's a very sad thing to do 
And honestly, I think the Civilization DLCs are particularly bad. They're examples of DLC that had very little effort put into them and as a direct result of it are a waste of time and money. And if that's the casualty, if modding is the casualty from their need to squeeze a little bit more money out of their title, then I think that is a terrible business strategy and in the long term is going to hurt them. And hopefully in a few years' time, they'll be able to look back on that and say, you know what, that was stupid. That was really, really dumb, and the success of Civ 4 is far and away way past that of Civ 5. And what kept Civ 4 going? Why did people keep buying Civ 4 every time it went on sale with the Beyond the Sword expansion and things like that? Hey, the modding scene. There you go. And they're not going to do that with Civ 5 at all. That I can guarantee. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox. I will be back at some point tomorrow. And remember that Mailbox does not run over the weekend. I'll see you next time.